Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. In this video D on the urinary system, we're going to focus on one part of the nephron called the renal corpuscle. And once we're done with that, we'll continue with the rest of the anatomy of the nephron in subsequent videos. We refer to the nephron of the kidney as the functional unit of the kidney because it's at that microscopic level that urine is created. There are about a million or so nephrons per kidney, so a lot. And as I said, they play a very important role in not just producing our urine, but as they, as they make urine, they're also going to influence, influence all kinds of aspects about our blood. Now, if we focus on the anatomy of a nephron, it consists of what we refer to as the renal corpuscle and then the renal tubule. So let me point these two structures out. So this area here, which looks kind of like a baseball glove with the capillary bed on the inside, that is the renal corpuscle. Remember, remember that the word corpuscle literally means little corpse or little body, translated. Attached to the renal corpuscle, then we have this very squiggly, squiggly tube, and we refer to that as the renal tubule. This portion here that I'm pointing to right now is not part of a nephron. Notice that there are many nephrons that feed into this tube, and therefore we refer to it as the collecting duct or the collecting tube. Usually uh, you'll hear me calling it the collecting duct. So this is not part of the nephron because it collects urine from many different nephrons. Eventually this collecting duct becomes part of the pyramids and where the pyramids form a point uh, where that opening was uh, is called the renal papilla, which then drains into the calyces. Now, the renal corpuscle, as you can see, consists of this, as I already mentioned, baseball uh, glove-shaped structure called the glomerular capsule or the Bowman's capsule with a capillary bed in the center. And then we also see within the renal tubule three different regions called the proximal convoluted tubule, which is this very squiggly tubule that is directly connected to the renal corpuscle. Then that proximal convoluted tubule, abbreviated as PCT, straightens out. As we enter into the medulla, we refer to this as the loop of Henle. The loop of Henle comes back out of the medulla to enter back into the cortex, and as it does, it forms another squiggly tubule, this time called the distal convoluted tubule because it sits more distally from our corpuscle. And then, as you already learned, there is your collecting duct. The renal tubule is surrounded like a cobweb with a capillary bed we refer to as the peritubular capillaries. We're going to focus, though, on the renal corpuscle for a, a bit. So the nephrons in a kidney can sit either really close to the medulla with this darker area here representing the medulla. So I'll put M for medulla and the lighter colored area here is the cortex. And notice that regardless of what kind of a nephron we're looking at, whether it's a nephron that sits close to the medulla or a nephron whose re renal corpuscle and most of its tubules are mostly present in the cortex, regardless of, of which nephron we look at, uh, we're going to see that they will always be made up of the same structures in their renal corpuscle. And that renal corpuscle is made up of two parts. One is called the Bowman's or glomerular ca capsule. That's this structure here that looks like the baseball glove. And that's what's going to have a lumen that's directly connected to the proximal convoluted tubule right here. So this is your Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsules lumen. 
and that connects to the tubule that leaves the Bowman's capsule called the proximal convoluted tubule. So over here on our smaller inset, we can barely point to the renal, uh, I'm sorry, to the glomerular capsule here. And then we see the beginning of our proximal convoluted tubule there. Now, this Bowman's capsule, as I like to call it, hugs a special capillary bed that we can't see very well here, and you'll learn why. That is the inside layer of the Bowman's capsule forming a covering um, around the capillaries of the capillary bed, which is referred to as the glomerulus. Notice that it is the afferent arterial here that feeds the blood into the glomerulus. Remember afferent referring to adding to. That's why it starts with the letter A. And then here, not labeled, is the efferent arterial. So blood enters via the afferent arterial into the glomerulus and then leaves via the efferent arterial spelled with the letter E. So that's kind of interesting, um, and that tells you that this is a special capillary bed. It's not a typical capillary bed. The other thing to notice, and we'll learn more about the structure in another video, is that, <clears throat> excuse me, we also see nearby the entry and the exit of the blood uh, into and out of the capillary bed called the glomerulus, this um, distal convoluted tubule. So remember that arising from the Bowman's capsule, I'm pointing to the top right here now, arising from the Bowman's capsule, we have our proximal convoluted tubule that then becomes the loop of Henle, and then it becomes squiggly again called the distal convoluted tubule. Well, that distal convoluted tubule is going to sit very close to our renal corpuscle, and you see that right here. This is our distal convoluted tubule, which typically has a much bigger lumen than the proximal convoluted tubule. You know, keep in mind that the way to visualize all these nephrons is not for them to sit nicely next to one another like that. Uh, your kidneys are three-dimensional structures, so these nephrons are going to um, sit somewhat organized, but there is going to be some three-dimensionality to them, particularly all these convoluted tubules, and that's what allows your distal convoluted tubule to literally uh, touch our, especially our afferent arterial. So keep that in mind for a, a later video. Now, if we look at the histology of the area where we find the renal corpuscle, so in other words, if we focus on the cortical area of our kidney, then we very clearly see our Bowman's capsules lumens surrounding the glomerulus. So that's what we're looking at here. All of these other tubules with their big lumen here and surrounded mostly by simple cuboidal epithelial tissue, some of them uh, clearer than others, most of those are proximal convoluted tubules, with this possibly being, as it says here, a distal convoluted tubule because of the, the size of that um, lumen. And there's also something that tells us, or tells me, that this must be a proximal convoluted tubule. As a matter of fact, all these simple cuboidal cells here clearly show microvilli, all this reddish stuff implies microvilli, which is characteristic for proximal convoluted tubules. So lots of information here, but um, again, we'll, we'll continue to focus now on the histology of the renal corpuscle. So let's first get a better understanding of the glomerulus, that specialized capillary bed. Well, the capillaries that make up the glomerulus are fenestrated capillaries, and remember that means that the capillaries, as always, are lined with simple squamous epithelial tissue, better called the endothelium, and on, on top of a bit of a basement membrane. But what's uh, different about the fenestrated capillaries and what sets them apart from the true capillaries 
is that the cell membrane of our endothelial cells are riddled with these little windows called fenestrations. And of course, these fenestrations allow for substances as well as water to, to pass through a little bit easier because it is a, a much thinner environment there cell-wise if, if um, there might be a little bit of a diaphragm covering these openings, but not a whole lot. If we now focus on the Bowman's capsule, or you can call it the glomerular capsule, where this right here, as we pointed out earlier, is the lumen. That's where the filtrate would accumulate when the blood is filtered. And it's going to be, or it is characterized by two distinct layers, and that is the parietal layer or the parietal epithelial tissue and the visceral epithelial, um, epithelial layer, I'm sorry, I meant to say with in between the, the lumen, which we can call the capsular space, or just the lumen of the Bowman's capsule, that's fine too. If we take a look at the parietal layer, then it is made up of simple squamous epithelial tissue. And as a matter of fact, in, in Anatomy and Physiolo Physiology 1, when you learn an example for the location of simple squamous epithelial tissue, you may have learned that it was the Bowman's capsule. But now you need to know more specifically where that simple squamous epithelial tissue is located. And it is in the parietal layer, the layer that faces outward. So the layer that literally touches our capillaries is very modified. And we refer to that as the visceral epithelium. That is the part that plays a role in filtration. That visceral epithelium, that layer that faces and touches the capillary bed called the glomerulus, it plays a very big role in the process of filtration, the filtering of the blood present in the glomerulus. On the other hand, the parietal peritoneum literally just gives our Bowman's capsule its shape. Notice that there's a very abrupt switch from simple squamous epithelial tissue to simple cuboidal tissue when we get to, to the proximal convoluted tubules. And you can also see the microvilli here in this epithelial tissue. So what is up with that inner visceral and uh, epithelium of the, of, the, of the Bowman's capsule? Well, it's a very modified epithelium. And here, when you look at the inset here, you get a little bit of an idea of what it's like. So here you see one of the capillaries that forms your big spaghetti mass, we call the, the glomerulus. And it's wrapped by these very specialized cells that form the uh, visceral layer of the Bowman's capsules. And we refer to those very specialized cells as podocytes, literally cells with feet, you could argue. And the podocytes, I may as well draw them. So they kind of look like this. The podocytes kind of look like this. And then they have these long extensions that literally little fingers that hug the capillary. So this would be one cell. I'll just give the nucleus as well. So that's the podocyte. The pedicels are these guys, are the fingers. Okay. Now, if I were to draw another podocyte, it would be, let me change colors. It would have its pedicels literally going in between the pedicels of the first podocyte I drew, kind of like that. And so my other podocyte is kind of right here, like so. All right, so its pedicels fit inside um, the openings that are formed between the pedicels of the other podocyte. And then you need to imagine that these cells, these two cells, which is hard for me to draw, completely wrap themselves around a capillary. 
And I give you an analogy here. Think of the fingers in a praying hand or with in praying hands, because I guess you need two hands to pray. Now I drew the pedestals just as, you know, these long finger-like structures, but they have actually within them even an, a more increased surface area. So if I were to grab one of those pedestals, really they look like this. You know, that would be one pedestal, and here's another one. I'm not doing the best job. So, um, you know, so this is one pedestal, and here's another pedestal. Um, so it gets, the surface area is, is humongous uh, when it comes to these pedestals. And so you can kind of see what I was trying to explain to you here in the upper left-hand corner how the pedestals branch and branch and branch and branch, but there's still little openings, notice, in between um, the, the pedestals of the podocytes, and that's important. So let's take a look at that. We call those openings filtration slits. Okay, so what happens in the kidneys is that, or what happens at the level of the renal corpuscles, is that blood arrives in the afferent arterioles at pretty high pressure, much higher than in any of the true capillaries somewhere else in the body. And so that hydrostatic high pressure is going to literally force the blood out of the capillaries. And the blood is going to first try to, or the, I should say the, the substances of the blood, which of course are the components in the plasma and, and the, 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 the formed elements. And what do we find in the plasma? Remember, we find um, big proteins in there. We find uh, um, all kinds of hormones and nutrients and gases, obviously, uh, and waste products. So the blood in this diagram here would be located right here. So I'm writing out blood. It's, it's right here. A represents our capillary. So these portions of cells that you see are, are simple squamous epithelial cells with within them fenestration. So whatever is in the blood is going to try to get through these fenestrations. All right, I'm using bright green. I'm not sure how well you can see that. And then these particles, whether it's the water or whether it's um, small nutrients, waste products, are going to also have to be able to make it through the base membrane. And that is the basement membrane that belongs to our capillary but also the basement membrane that belongs to our visceral epithelium. Remember, the visceral epithelium is made up of our, of our podocytes, and these are your pedicels, with in between them the filtration slits. So the pedicels here, with in between them, you know, all these little openings here, which are the filtration slits. So our substances have to try to get not just through this basement membrane, but also through the filtration slits, which are, uh, again, slightly covered with like a, a diaphragm type um, membrane, as it says right here. Now, as these substances that are in the blood um, try to cross each one of these levels of what we call our filtration membrane, Right, so this is our filtration, oops, filtration membrane. They have a bigger and bigger challenge because the, the size of molecule that can pass through each level from A, that is the fenestrations basically, then the basement membrane, then the filtration slits gets increasingly smaller. So initially, maybe some of the bigger particles do sneak out of the fenestrations, but then they might get stuck in the basement membrane because they're, they're just too big and can never even leave that basement membrane 
to make it into the filtrate. And there's ways for the kidneys to deal with these things that get stuck in the basement membrane. And of course, many things will not ever even manage to get through these fenestrations. Um, you know, think for instance of cells, they cannot get through. And certainly the bigger proteins like albumin, they're not going to be able to get through unless there is damage to this filtration membrane, which we, seem to ha which we see happening, for instance, in people who've had diabetes for a long time. Uh, all those high glucose levels in the blood begin to actually damage this filtration membrane such that um, various larger um, molecules will start to be able to get through um, this filtration membrane. Okay, so these are the different levels that the water, the wastes, and even a, a lot of nutrients uh, and all kinds of electrolytes uh, must go through in order to then become part of the filtrate. And you might go, wait a minute, nutrients are going to leave the blood and become part of the filtrate? And the answer to that is yes, but your kidneys will have a mechanism to not let those nutrients become part of the urine. So we will get to that. So filtration is just a process that depends on a pressure gradient. So the pressure here in the blood is going to be higher than the pressure here in the lumen of our Bowman's capsule. And so that pressure gradient allows for the blood to be pushed through what we call our filtration membrane. We need that pressure gradient. And this is a very rough process of sorting things out to, and that as a consequence, we end up also allowing for a bunch of good stuff to leave the blood, nutrients. But like I said, we have, the kidneys have a way of reclaiming those nutrients. So they typically do not get disposed of or excreted. And so here we're taking a look at an electron micrograph, um, a transmission electron micrograph of the filtration membrane. Uh, this is always kind of nice to look at for you to remind yourself of how small everything is. For instance, right here you see your gigantic erythrocyte. Uh, remember, erythrocytes are going to be on average about seven to eight micrometers in diameter. That tells you how tiny the fenestrations are here of your capillaries. And they call it a pore here. Here we have then our basement membrane, you know, of both the um, endothelium as well as the, this is your endothelium, as well as the visceral layer with these uh, pedicels that are part of your Podocyte. And pedicels can also be called foot processes. So your foot-like cells have little toes or foot processes, the pedicels. And in between, you have those filtration slits. So what needs to happen is that uh, a waste product, water, even nutrients must, if I, drew, if I draw those as a little star, they have to then make it through the, the fenestration, through the basement membrane, through the filtration slits. And if they're too big, they can't make it there.